<laughs> right, here we go. It's take two. So um, tonight we're looking at the Intermediate Paper 2 Calculator Allowed from uh, summer 2017. Well, we've already figured out um, what we're aiming for. We're looking for 40 out of 80 for a C, 52 for a B. That takes us for the C boundary up towards the end of question 11. So we'll get there and then we'll take a break um, at that point. We've already pre-filled in the extra formula that are useful. The trig triangles are going to be particularly useful on a paper two, so it's important that we can remember those. Also, circles, whether it's area, circumference, or volume, highly likely to come up on a paper two mass um, paper. They could still ask us these um, metric to imperial conversions and speed, distance, time, and one that I've added tonight uh, is density, mass, and volume they could be useful too. Okay, so let's get started. First question. Calculate 39% of 576 pounds. Now, the really important thing to remember is this is a calculator allowed paper. The number of times I see uh, candidates trying to work out 10%, then 1%, making a mistake because they're horrible numbers and getting it wrong. The only thing you need to remember here is of actually means times. There's no of button on our calculator. So in our heads, we've got to make that conversion. But there is a percent button on our calculator. So I can do the 39% times 576. So on your calculator, you would type that in. Percent is shift and open bracket times 576 and then SD to turn it into um, decimals, and you can see there, 222, sorry, 224 pound 64. Now, if you just wrote down 224.64 without the units, it doesn't matter, because they're not asking you for them, but it's just good habit to do. Um, and then on part B, exactly the same thing again. The only part of that sum that I can't press a button on the calculator for is of. So what I'm doing here is 3 sevenths times 100. So on your calculator, your fraction button is um, the one which is two blocks on, sitting on top of each other. 3, 7 times 100 equals. And then you get a string of numbers. Now, what I strongly suggest you do with any question that has got an extra little sting in the tail, where it's asking you for nearest 10, nearest whole number, one decimal place, three significant figures, is before you go and do that, write down a, a large part of what's on your calculator screen. Because that's showing the examiner that, well, you've done the first bit right, if you then mess up the next bit, they can go back and check that the calculation you've done is correct. So where that's worth two marks, I know I've got one there safe, even if I mess up the nearest whole number. So the nearest whole number is either two or three. So we're either going to be looking at 42 or 43. Look at the digit next to that. It's eight, so it's closer. That number's going to be closer to 43. How many quarters are there in 10? Lots of candidates really struggled with this. If I asked um, how many twos there are in 10, you would know, well, that's a divide, 10 divided by two. So what that's basically asking you, because we're on a calculator, is to do that, 10 divided by a quarter. So we can type that in exactly as we see it, 10 divide fraction one over 4, 40. Okay, so because it's on a calculator paper, that's the way to do it. They could ask you that on the non-calculator paper, and then all you need to think of is, well, how many quarters are there in 1? Well, in 1, you're going to have 4 quarters in a whole. So if in 1 unit you've got 4, in 10 lots of that, you'd have 10 lots of 4, 40. But we can use a calculator, so that doesn't matter. What fraction is equal to 50% of 1 sixth? Well, the only thing I need to change on that is the of to times. I've got my 50%. 50 
button. So 50% of fraction 1 over 6. 1 twelfth. So if you know how to use these buttons on your calculator, these really are straightforward questions. Circle the fraction that is a recurring decimal. Well, if you type in 21 over 35 equals, the first thing it does is it simplifies it. So that fraction in its simplest form is 3 fifths. If I press SD again, it turns into a decimal. Well, that's not recurring because recurring means uh, the digit will repeat. If I do 10 over 12, That's 5 over 6. If I change that, you can see there now that that 3 has got a dot above it. And that's the symbol for recurring. So if I wanted to write that out, I'd write it at 0 0.8333333 forever. So that is a recurring decimal. And that's the sig signal on the calculator. So again, if you know how to use that in your calculator, it's really straightforward. Right, marks for that. Um, you've got one mark for the method. Okay, so writing that method out would get you one mark, and then one mark for the answer. Similarly for this one, sight of that would get you one mark, and then for answering the question to the nearest whole number gets you the other. That's a straightforward right or wrong, that's a right or wrong, and that's a right or wrong. So there's uh, two, four, six, seven marks there, just for knowing how to use your calculate properly. Question two. Circle either true or false for each of the following statements. A triangle with one angle equal to 70 could be an equilateral triangle. So this is testing your knowledge of what an equilateral triangle is. Equilateral triangle is one where all sides are the same, and if all the sides are the same, all the angles are the same, so they'd all be 180 divided by 360. So that is false. A triangle with one angle equal to 70 could be isosceles. Well, if we're not sure, let's test it. We know with an isosceles triangle, the two base angles have to add up to 180. Sorry, both base angles are the same. So if I take 70 off 180, I get 110. Divide 110 by 2, I get 55 and 55. So that could be true. A triangle with one angle equal to 70 could be right-angled. Right angle, 70. 70 and 90 is 160, so that could be 20. So that's true. An isosceles triangle could have one of its angles equal to 105. So same thing if it's isosceles. That one and that one are the same. So take 105 from 180, 75, half of 75, 37 and a half. Nothing wrong with half a degree, so 37.5, nothing wrong with that, so that's true. A right angle triangle could have one of its angles equal to 105. So if that's my right angle, and that's 105, well, if I add 105 and 90 together, and bust, I'm over 180. So that's got to be false. Yeah, it's that, that comes to 195 degrees for two angles. So that's false. Marks for that. Three marks if you get them all right. Two marks for any four correct. One mark, in order to get one mark, you'd need to get three of them right. Question three. Calculate the answer when the largest prime number that is a factor 
Okay, so there's your true. There's two trigger words here. Prime and factor. Prime and factor. So you need to know what factors are, first of all. Factors are numbers that divide exactly into the number you're given. And when you're finding them, it's usually best to group them in pairs. So start with 1, and that's paired with 28, because 1 times 28 is 28. 2 and 14. 3 doesn't go into 28. 4 doesn't go into 28. Yes, it does, 7 times. 5 doesn't go into 28. Seven, 6 doesn't go into 78. 7 does, but 7 and 4 just repeat the, the cycle then. So those are the only factors of 28. Then the factors of 15 would be 1 and 15. 2 doesn't go into it. 3 does, 5 times. And then 4 doesn't, 5 does, 3 times. So that takes us back to the, the start. So I know that I've got all my numbers. The largest prime number in my list there, remember prime numbers, the only even prime number is 2. So, the largest prime number there is going to be 7. Because all the others are even. So, the largest prime number is 7. And we're multiplying that by the smallest prime number that is a factor of 15. And the smallest prime number there is 3. 1 isn't a prime number. 5 is, but it's the biggest one. 3 is the smallest. So, they're looking for 21. And marks for that. They're looking for seven or three to get one mark, both of them unmultiplied for two marks. Okay, question four number machines. The diagram below shows a number machine. Using the number machine, calculate the input when the output is 36. Now, when I do percentages with you, um, often I draw it as a number machine. And I say, if we're traveling backwards through a number machine, the, you do the workings out in the opposite order. And also, you change the operators to their opposites. So rather than multiplying by 3, the first thing we're going to do is divide by 3 then subtract 7, and that will give me my answer. So I'll do 36 divided by 3. Now it's really important you press equals at each stage. So it's going to be 12, take away 7, 5. But then you can always check your right by going the other way. So if the input is 5, if I add 7 to 5, I get 12. Times it by 3, I get 36. I know I've got that right. The output when the input is n. <coughs> now, you have to be cute here because there is a really common mistake to make, which is this. If you put n in and then you add 7 and then you multiply by 3 and that gives you your output. But if you write it like that, we're not doing the remember to press equals bit. The only thing there that be, that's being multiplied by 3 is the 7. So in order to make it right, you've got to put brackets around the first bit because from bid mass, you know that you work the brackets out first. So it's telling you to press equals. So be careful. That question comes up quite often. You've got to put the brackets around the first bit, otherwise you're not going to get the marks. So marks for that, uh, there's one mark for five. You would have got one mark if I'd have seen n plus seven times three with no brackets. But for the two marks, because it's actually wrong, um, you need to have the brackets on there. Question five. Write down three integers. So that's a trigger word there. You've got to know that that means whole numbers. So it's saying write down three whole numbers 
all smaller than 25, whose range is 8, and whose mean is 13. The key bit in this is that second bullet point, mean is 13, because from that you can find out what the total of the numbers are. Because the total is the mean multiplied by the count, how many there are, and there are three. So if they give you the mean, you can find the total. So 13 times 3 is 39. So these three numbers have to add up to 39. Um, and they're all less than 25. And the difference between the biggest and the smallest is 8. So if I was to say, um, if I was to say for a difference of 8, if I made the biggest 16 and that one 8, then they add up to 24. So it's the difference between 39 and 24. 15. So those three numbers, they've got a range of 8 because the biggest takeaway the smallest is 8. They add up to 39 and because they add up to 39 it means when I divide it by 3 I'll get a mean of 13. So marks for that. Two marks if you've got all three of them. One mark if your numbers have got a range of 8 or a mean of 13. That hasn't come up yet on any of the other papers, so you may well ask something like that. Question six. Write down the first three terms of the sequence whose nth term is given by 2n minus 5. So they're not asking me to find the nth term. I've got to use it. I use it to find the first term. I replace the n with 1. So first, and if you remember, what I say to you is when you're replacing a letter with a number put it in a bracket because it forces you to multiply it. 2 times 1 is 2, take away 5, negative 3. For the second term, n will be 2. So it'll be 2 bracket 2, take away 5. 2 twos are 4, take away 5, negative 1. And for the third term, n is 3. 2, 3 is a 6, take away 5, 1. So the first three terms are negative 3, negative 1, and 1. So if the question had said, what's the 50th term? We'd replace the n by 50 and work it out. The thousandth term, same thing. Write down an expression for the nth term of the following sequence. So now we're looking for a rule like that, 2n minus 5. So the way we've taught you this... Look at the differences. The differences need to be the same, otherwise um, we've got a, um, a more complicated question. So the difference there is 4, it's 4, it's 4. It's going up in 4s, which makes it a 4n rule. If the first term was 4, it would just be a 4n rule, because it would be the 4 times table. But because the first term is 4, is 7, sorry, I've got to add 3 in order to move from 4 to 7. So it's actually a 4n plus 3 rule. If that had been in the second half of the paper, and maybe those numbers were not the same, then the chances are it would have been an n squared rule, and that would have been a bit trickier. But where it is, that's just straightforward. So um, for the first part, there's two marks for all three, um, or one mark for any two that are correct. For the second part, there's one mark for the 4n, one mark for the 4n plus 3. Question 7, probability. As I mentioned before, in the numeracy papers, there is no probability. So they go to town on probability on the, on the maths papers. So it's worth practicing your probability stuff. A dice is thrown 50 times. The number shown on the dice is recorded after each throw. The table below shows the results recorded. So 
um, going back to what I'd say in class, pick a column, make sure you understand what that is saying. So that is saying there that of the 50 throws of the dice, seven of them were two. Of the 50 throws of the dice, six of them were five, and so on. The relative frequency of throwing a one was calculated as nine over 50. What was the relative frequency of throwing a six? So throwing a six was 13 times out of 50. Give your answer as a decimal. So if you just write it as 13 out of 50, you're not gonna get the mark for this. If you can't do that in your head, which you might be able to, because it's out of 50, but if not, remember your fraction button is your friend, because if you type it in as a fraction, and then do the SD, it turns it into a decimal for you. The number four was thrown seven times in the first 50 throws. Using this fact, calculate how many times you would expect a four to be thrown when the dice is thrown 3,000 times. So the relative frequency is telling you seven out of 50. So the probability of you uh, getting a four is seven out of 50. If you repeat that 3,000 times, the maths you're gonna do is that. Fraction button, seven out of 50 times 3,420 times. So you would expect that to occur 420 times. Part C, how many times would you expect a four to be thrown when a fair dice is thrown? So a fair dice is just your normal dice where every number is equally likely to come up. So on a fair dice, you'd expect a four to come up one out of six times. So to turn that then into a number out of 3,000, we do one out of six times 3,000. So you'd expect that to occur 500 times. Okay, so this is a biased dice because it's not doing what it's supposed to. So marks for that is one mark for 0.26, a method mark for writing down that, and an answer mark for 420, a method mark for one in six times 3,000, and an accuracy mark, answer mark for 500. Question eight. So sadly this came up, or a question like this came up on Tuesday. So ABCD is a regular pentagon. Regular means all the sides are the same length. So it's like an equilateral triangle, but for pentagons. So that means all sides same length or equal. Pentagon means it's got five sides, which doesn't matter because you can count them because they're giving you the picture. Calculate the size of angle X. Well, the way to access this is here. Because a pentagon is made up of triangles, isosceles triangles, all of those angles at the center are the same size. So I know that angles around a point add up to 360. So the angles at the center would be 360 divided by five. So 360 divided by five, 72 degrees. So I now know that angle there is 72 degrees. That means that they may look like equilateral triangles, but they can't be equilateral because they'll all be 60. So they're going to be isosceles. Because that shape is regular, the distance from the center to any one of the corners is gonna be the same. 
So to find angle X, I'm going to do 72 from 180, because angle X and that one there are going to be the same. So uh, all, I'll write it down. You wouldn't need to. This isn't. This could have been a, an OCW question, but it's not. All triangles are isosceles. So 180 take away 72. It's 108. Divide that by 2, and you get x is 54 degrees. The one on Tuesday's paper was nastier than that because it, it asked you to work out um, an angle to the vertical. But that's how you would have got, got actually into the question. So how many marks for that? Four marks. So you've got a method mark for doing 360 divided by 5 and an accuracy answer mark for 72. Then you've got a method mark for doing the 180 take away 72 divided by 2. And an accuracy mark for your answer of 54 degrees. Question 9. So this looks horrible. Look at the diagram below. The expression in each circle is found by adding the expressions in the rectangles on either side of the circle. Complete the diagram by writing expressions in the blank circles and the blank rectangle. You must simplify your expressions. Okay, so here's the, here's the instruction. This is what's happening. The expression in each circle is found by adding the ones either side. And they've given you a complete one to help you figure it out. So to get that there, I'm doing 3x plus 1x is 4x. 1y plus 4y is 5y. So to get this down here, I've got to figure out what have I got to add to 3x to make 8x, which is going to be 5x. What have I got to add to 1y to make 3y, 2y? Let's check that works. 5x plus 3x is 8x. 2y plus 1y is 3y. Now I can do this one. 5x plus 4x is 9x. 2y, take away 1y, is 1y, which we can write as 1y or y. And then for the final circle, 4x plus x is 5x. 4y, take away 1y, is 3y. So it looks horrible, but actually... It's quite a nice little algebra question. So there's one mark for each of the complete gaps there. Question 10. So here's our OCW question. So in this one, it is important that you are um, trying to organize your work. So A, B, C, F. A, B, C, F is a rectangle. C, D, E, F is a trapezium. So as soon as you see that, you're thinking, whoa, that's one of my formulas. It's one of the few ones that they're actually giving you. So if I'm going to be asked to find an area, I'm going to be coming back to that. B, D is a straight line. A, B is 7 centimetres. B, D is 9. And D, E is 3. The perimeter of a rectangle A, B, C, F is 24 centimetres. Calculate the area of the trapezium, okay? So I will be coming back to that. Now to work out the area of the trapezium, I need to know the lengths of both parallel sides. So I need to know that is 3. That one, because it's a rectangle, I know is going to be 7. It's a flash in. I need the height. I know it's 9 from B to D, but at the moment, 
I don't know that distance. So before I can find the area, I've got to figure out H. In order to figure out H, I know it's 9 from B to D. So if I can get BC, I've got my, my way in. Okay? So I need to look now at what information I'm given about that rectangle. Sometimes they'll tell you it's area. In this one, they're telling you it's perimeter. So the perimeter is 24. I know that is 7 and that is 7. Perimeter is the distance all the way around the outside of the shape. So I can take those 14 off um, the perimeter and it'll leave me the combined distance from AF and BC. So, um, per, blah, 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 so what am I doing? So I'm, I'm going to do 24 take away 14, which is 10 centimeters. So AF and BC are 10 divided by 2, 5 centimetres each. Okay, because I know the perimeter, total distance all the way around is 24. That side and that side come to 14, which leaves me 10 centimetres between there and there. Because it's a rectangle, I know that they're the same length. So halving that gives me 5 centimetres. Now... height of trapezium would be 9 distance from there to there take away 5 so now I can use this now I can use my write it here half A plus B H so the area of trapezium equals half now the calculator again super clever thing can pretty much do this in the same way as it's written so you do half bracket then a and b is seven add three but it needs to have a times before the h and the h is four so you can figure that out on paper or you can use your calculator so using your calculator fraction half open bracket 7 add 3 close bracket times 4 equals 20 so the area of the rectangle is 20 now it's not asking you to show your units but because this is an OCW question, it's expecting you to be consistent with your units. So you'd be penalised if you didn't finish this with 20 centimetres squared. So marks for that. For the maths, first of all, there's two marks for the getting to the 5 centimetres. There's one mark then for the area of the trapezium plugging everything into the formula and an answer mark for the 20. And then for the OCW, the extra two, remember what they're given for is how organised you can be. So just explaining what each step is doing. It's not writing a story, it's just so AF and BC, so the height is this, the area is that. And then the second one for being consistent with your units. Centimetres, when you're talking about length, centimetres squared there. And those will give you the extra two marks. Okay, so one more question to get us into this grade C. And these are questions, again, that are super on your calculator. So we can type this onto our calculator exactly as we see it square root 8.5 you've got a cube button which is there next to the abs button plus open bracket 
minus 0 0.76 close bracket squared you've got an x squared button so you calculate the screen tells you that now this is another one where they're asking you to do a bit of rounding afterwards so before you start rounding in case you make a mistake you are going to do 25.0621 blah 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 okay and you can get away with blah 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 you don't have to put the whole thing there but just to show that it's continuing three significant figures with significant figures you start counting straight away because the most significant figure here is the two because it's in the tens column so your three significant figures are that one that one and that one so my answer is either going to be 25.0 or 25.1 you look at the next one along more than five which means that is 25.1 to three and then s f after it reciprocal means one over so what that actually means is one over negative 0 0.07 which we can put in our calculator just like that you need to remember when you're putting a negative number on your calculator it's not the subtract button the negative button is that one there when the pen is pointing so that's what we want to do and it comes out to be minus 100 over 7 there's another trigger here they want me to write that in decimals so if I press SD I get minus 14.2857 blah 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 to one decimal place now we don't we start counting as soon as we pass the decimal point so one decimal place is either going to be minus 14.2 or minus 14.3 next digit along is 8 so it's closer to 14.3 to 1 D P. So marks for that. One mark for 25 point something. Two marks for the correct rounding. Same for this one. One mark for 14.2 blah blah blah. Two marks if you then correctly round it to the nearest decimal place. So that's gets us into the C&B questions.